Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo sapiens. After thousands and thousands of years of evolution, we have a new discovery. Home sapiens has always been around. Places where we live are key to humans. From caves to huts, and from houses to modern villas, our homes have been evolving with us. Is home sapiens fiction or reality? It is up to you to decide. Hello and uh, good morning, good afternoon. It is my honor that today our guest is Charles Whitball, who works as Program and Advocacy Manager at Habitat for Humanity South Africa. Habitat South Africa has a number of projects in different informal settlements across the country, and Charles has really first had experience working in this area. So I would like to have a conversation with him about informal settlements and slum areas. Hello, Charles, and um, welcome to our podcast. And maybe we can start with just having a first question to you. What is a slum? Good morning, good afternoon, listeners, and thank you, Katya, for giving me this opportunity to respond to you and to see if I can um, answer some of these questions based on our experience in South Africa. What is a slum? So, first of all, I think it's important just to point out to our listeners that um, we refer to a slum in South Africa more in terms of an informal settlement or squatter camp. Uh, we use the term slum uh, very seldom, and it might have something to do with our political past, where previously the government used the Slum Clearance Act to forcefully remove people who were living in dire situations um, and, and conditions. So throughout this uh, interview, you might hear me refer to informal settlement, but uh, the two words are, are interchangeable, slum in, informal settlement, and then also squatter camps is the other word that we use in South Africa. The, the slum or informal settlement in South Africa, we see as um, an area where people live in temporary structures, often with no basic services. Um, but the degree of formality can, can vary from informal settlement to informal settlement. So some areas have rudimentary services. This means that um, some of them um, have households, four to five households, sharing the ablution facilities or sharing a standpipe. Um, sometimes some of them have electricity, others have none. Uh, so the combination of services in informal settlements are less than what the, we would have in a normal formal residential area. And most of the time, people live in temporary structures within those informal settlements. Okay. Uh, thank you, Charles. I think it's very uh, good to understand. And thank you very much for pointing out also the different terms that I used, especially in the context of South Africa. Uh, maybe a follow-up question that I have. How did these informal settlements actually begin in South Africa? How did they appear? Why people are living in informal settlements? And uh, do you have an estimate? Can you estimate how many people currently are housed in these informal settlements or in slum-like conditions in South Africa? So just in our historical context, which is pre-1994, we had segregated areas within South Africa. So the population was uh, scattered um, in terms of racial groups, and each racial group had their own geographical area in which they, in which they lived. Post-1994, of course, we were now part of the broader world, and we're People of color in certain instances were defined to a specific area, which was predominantly far away from economic opportunities, um, had now had the opportunity to travel across the country to job opportunities um, at scale. So we had less informal settlements previous to 1994 closer to the urban areas, but it has basically come about to people having the right now to move around freely. And this has given rise to us ending up with quite a bit of informal settlements, 
possibly more in line with international trends of developing countries. And can you name um, maybe a few of these informal settlements? What are the largest or the biggest ones in South Africa? And in what parts of the country are they located? So the big in- informal settlements are around the metropolitan cities. So our economic hub in South Africa is in Johannesburg, in Gauteng province. So there you have um, possibly some of your biggest informal, informal settlement areas, but your other areas like Alexander and Soweto, those are more formal now since, since the dawn and um, has given rise to formal housing. In the Western Cape, um, Cape Town, where our head office is based, we have areas, um, informal settlements around Langa. Then we have others in Guguletu, Kailicha, possibly one of the of the biggest ones. We've done some work in Masipumalele, which is to the south of, of Cape Town. Um, but these are just some of the informal settlements um, in, in South Africa. Okay, thank you, Charles. Maybe just a little bit more. I know that you have mentioned it earlier, but maybe just to spell a little bit out more for people to understand what are really the conditions. Um, so if we take, for example, Kalecha Islam, what are the conditions there? Do people have drinking water? Do they have access to medical services? Um, do children who live in these informal sell- settlements there, um, do they attend school? Can they attend school? Um, is it really uh, high criminality rates in these areas that, that, that are reported or this is a little, a little bit like prejudice and um, in, in reality things are different? The people who live in informal settlements by the very nature are, are marginalized uh, people and are people that has um, a condition of extreme poverty and that is a part of the reason of why they end up in informal settlements. Um, the informal settlement uh, in, in Kailicha, um, there's a combination of living conditions in Kailicha, from, from formal housing to affordable housing to market-related bonded housing with proper economic opportunities. And then, and then there are parts of Kailicha where it is completely informal with very limited services. So you don't even have access to basic services. And typically in the worst conditions, there will be no running water, there would be no bulk service in terms of ablution, and there would be no electricity. So in, 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 in our conditions in, in Cape Town, very often these slum areas, the informal settlement areas, is not within the urban center. So when I say it's within the metropolitan, it could easily be 30 to 35 kilometers away from the CBD. It's almost then closer to a decentralized node in terms of economic opportunities, but it's not close to the urban core that you might have in other international cities. So people can really be in a situation where they are marginalized in more than one way with access to very, very little. And the crime can be rife. Um, Very, very often it is quite unsafe um, for women and children and uh, it is not a pleasant environment at all. And why there is a difference within an informal settlement? There are areas, as you said, that they're more formalized and then those that are less formalized and th- those are more informal. So why, why there is such a big difference or such a diversity in one settlement? So when I say a settlement, maybe one needs to, in this context, use a broader term. So Kailicha would be a, a, a suburb um, within Cape Town metropolitan area. And in the suburb of Kailicha, you will have a combination of um, housing opportunities, which is then which then comprise of that commercial driven housing, affordable housing, um, what we refer to as PNG housing, which is free housing from government. And then you have an informal settlement. So these will not be necessarily in one exact geographical uh, a footprint, in a, in, on a small footprint, but it could be spread out over many kilometers that people live like that in varying um, conditions. But part of the big reason is in South Africa, our housing for poorer people is driven or was driven over the last, um, what's that, 26 years since 1994 by a free housing product that government give to eligible uh, beneficiaries. And to some degree, some people are waiting for their turn to to get their their free house. And and very often um, it takes 
much longer than what the beneficiary anticipates. So, so what you have is the people living in those informal settlements with the hope that their name will come up on the list when the next housing project um, happens. And um, the only way or, or one way of getting onto that list is, of course, if you are in an informal settlement, there's a clear um, indication that you have a need for a house and your name is on a waiting list. And as the projects then roll out, the beneficiary at some point, which at sometimes can be 10, 15 years, some have waited all the time since 1994 and still not have gotten a house. And, and, and yeah, so, so that is how people end up, um, basically they have no finances to acquire a house in the market. And then the only way for them to get the independence is to end up living in an informal settlement. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting insights. Thank you very much. And uh, can you maybe, uh, Charles, tell us a little bit more, what do people do uh, uh, in the informal settlements? Those who live in informal settlements, uh, do these people have jobs? Um, do they engage in certain activities? Um, is there like a typical profile? of people who live in these areas, or these are just people who have really, really very low income and um, very low paid jobs and they cannot afford anything else, so they end up living in informal settlements. I think your last point has a, has a lot to do with it. I think it's low income and, and there's, there's no affordability. But what we've also found is they are it's different for each, for each community. Um, so in the metropolitan areas, people come and live in informal settlements. They sometimes travel in from other provinces that have less opportunities than others. Because if you think about it, how thing is that's our economic hub. There's lots of job opportunities if you're going to be want to be exposed to economic opportunities in Cape Town um, at the at the lower scale. So so people travel in, and the reason why they come in is for employment opportunities. Some of them. Quite, quite frankly, is looking for, for health services. Some of them are looking for educational opportunities for, for, for their children. And so there are different drivers of why people end up. You get the people who were living in the area and want independence and move out of a formal house where maybe they were living with parents. And then they get the independence. You get people traveling in, as I've said earlier, who are looking for access to school, social services, and other amenities. They are so... And what they do is um, could be completely different, but there are often people in informal settlements who are prepared to work, obviously. And then there's a there's a wide range of what it is that people do, from being more skilled labor as as and, and as, as as low down as as, as unskilled labor. Yes, of course, it's it's always like that. It's very hard to judge everyone with just like one approach. Um, but uh, is there any estimate maybe or maybe um, something that you know from experience of working in those areas? Uh, of course, there are a lot of successful examples of how people manage to get educational opportunities, uh, even become really successful businessmen, those people who grew up in informal settlements. Is there any like percentage or maybe you know how many of those people can really make it into the world that's a that, that's a difficult one katya I've, I've i must admit i have never looked and uh seen something like that a percentage of where people have made it um and, and they've followed stories but we've certainly had some successes like that um in south africa like i'm sure they've had across the world but there is no percentage that i've seen of people making it up the conditions are are dire and um, as one can just imagine more often than not you are not going to make it out of there and, and that is why it is so critical for us to contribute positively to the upgrade of these of these areas yes uh, and this is actually a nice segue into the next question that I wanted to ask you, Charles. Um, what can be done to improve the living conditions for people who live in, in these informal settlements? And who should lead this work? Is this the government? Is, um, uh, is this the communities? or the non-profit organizations, or there should be some leaders who take this matters into their own hands. Um, what, what do you think? Uh, what should be the approach? How do we tackle these problems? So for us at the moment in South Africa, our human settlement policy is driven by our government national department that is called Department of Human Settlements, Water and Sanitation. 
And the reason why I want to start at that point is to latch on to our current pandemic at the moment that we face in terms of um, COVID-19. And um, this has brought, this COVID-19 pandemic has brought the fast track of, of basic services right to the fore. As we can see, in the absence of a medical cure or vaccine, um, the remedy against COVID-19 is almost um, driven by shelter, because with shelter comes improved hygiene. You can wash your hands regularly, have access to running water. You can do better social distancing from neighbors or others outside your immediate family. Um, and you can self-isolate if you if you need to, which will then protect the rest of the family and you can protect your neighbors and the broader community. And so I would say, Katya, in the context of South Africa, it is imperative for government to try this process because we have such a formal institutional housing framework within which we work, of which we have varied um, housing programs of how it is that we roll it out, from programs dealing with the upgrade of informal settlement to the building of a top structure with the proper community, with halls, tarred roads, the whole lot, underground services in terms of um, engineering services and, and, and so on. So in my mind, the process, of course, should be driven by government. Government makes budget available, be it insufficient um, to do it all at once. But it is important that the community forms an integral part in this process. So, so, so often the informal dwellers do not see eye to eye with government. So we've, we've come across this where the interaction between the two parties is not what it can be. The relationship is often not what it should be. And this is where we find that the NGOs can play a big role, an impartial role. We are often seen as people who can listen to both sides of the stories, bring the stakeholders together around a common purpose and to achieve a common goal to improve the life of the informal um, settlement dweller. Yes, it, it's very interesting. Thank you. I think if there is one thing positive that came out of COVID, maybe it's the attention that the governments have started paying to housing and housing issues. So hopefully that would also translate into some funding and some projects that can be done to really help people improve uh, the living conditions. Maybe just at the end of our conversation, I wanted to ask you something, uh, you know, something that is just a more maybe personal question. Um, you know, what what is a house? What is a home for you? And uh, do you think that informal settlements can also become simple and decent homes for people, especially provided that they have the basic services and everything that is needed uh, for for people who live there? Katya, I think this is going to be a new learning ground for us now uh, in South Africa where we, the aim, as I said earlier, is to bring basic services to all as quickly as possible. So in terms of what then makes a home, is going to be like an iterative result of the process that we find ourselves in. So the idea is that we create then in terms of our legislation, these communities in a formal manner where each one or most of the informal dwellers will end up with some geographical footprint on the ground that is that they will now in some way into the future become the proud owner of. But previously where government would have built the top structure, it will now be up to those families as they receive their basic services to take it from, from a service site to something of a, a decent place to live in, which they call home according to their um, definition and whatever it is they can afford, but ultimately resulting in a top structure which they can be proud to live in. In my opinion, the way I see a home, a home is something where some a family lives together with sufficient space to go about their daily operations and where they are in a secure environment and children have the ability to be able to go to school access to come back home, do homework, and live a normal life as normal, however it is that we define normal, but in a way where they can improve their lives going into the into the future, always better than the previous gen generation. And, and for me, um, a formal dwelling, be it with alternative building technology, 
be it with conventional brick and mortar or whatever is conventional in any particular ge geographical um, location. I, I just think it's something where people can live in a secure environment with dignity to go about their business in a family and in a community context. Indeed, I think it's a very nice ending to our conversation. So thank you very much, Charles. It was really interesting to learn all these things and also learning about different approaches, how we can approach and tackle the problems of housing are for people who live in informal settlements. So thank you very much for this conversation. And thank you very much for having me, Kat. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Home Matters to Humans. You've listened to the Home Sapiens podcast produced by Habitat for Humanity. It is part of the Build Solid Ground project funded by the European Union. 